afternoon. Thank you very much for coming out for our third Public Health Dialogues this term. I want to go over a few things quickly and I'm going to look at my notes to see what I'm going over here. So, first of all, um, where are my radiology students? Are there radiology people in here? Show of hands. Thank you very much for coming. Can somebody holler out your interest in our speaker today? If it was required, just say so. <laughs> Great. Glad to have you. And we have some internal medicine people here as well. Great. Thank you very much for coming. Where are my public health people? I know they're here. Yep. Great. And then I have Extension Service. Cindy Fitch is here. Is there anybody else from Extension Service? We're really trying to get um, a diverse crowd in here. So we want to have people from other schools and people from downtown. So spread the word and let them know they're welcome. How many people know that we are videotaping these events? We are videotaping. And so one thing that we have noticed is that our lovely little plastic containers make all kinds of popping noises when you open them and when you close them. So I don't know how you can do it, but if you can minimize the noise of opening those containers. And then no need to close them. Don't close them till you walk out of the room. <laughs> That may be kind of hard, but I think we put trash cans outside the room. So if you'll just carry your container and put it out there. If it's a real big problem, leave it where it is, and we will try to collect it for you. Okay, so as they say in the theater, theater, open your lunch now if you haven't opened it so that we can get started. Dr. Braverman and I just had a reacquaintance outside um, but we first encountered each other when I was in Texas working on my doctorate with the Texas Program for Society and Health under Dr. Alvin Tarlov. And at that time he said, you should get to know Paula. And I said, okay. And then I just started following her work all the way from about 2001 until now. And so we have talked many times, exchanged emails, and I finally got her in the same room where I am. And so I'm really excited to have her here and I hope that you will be as well. As you know from the materials you received, Dr. Braverman is a professor of family and community medicine and director of the Center on Social Disparities in Health at the University of California, San Francisco. For more than 25 years, she has studied and published extensively on health equity and the social determinants of health and has actively engaged in bringing attention to these issues in the U.S. and internationally. Her research has focused on socioeconomic and racial and ethnic disparities in health, particularly in maternal and infant health and health care. During the 1990s, she worked with the World Health Organization staff in Geneva to develop and implement a global initiative on equity in health and health care. Throughout her career, she has collaborated with local, state, national, and international health agencies to see rigorous research translated into practice with the goal of achieving greater equity in health. She was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences in 2002. So what I would like for us to kind of focus on today as we listen to Dr. Braveman is the ideas and the concepts that she's going to provide for us today. And we are in West Virginia, we all understand that. But I think the challenge that we have is trying to figure out how these ideas and concepts can transform our work in public health interventions, public policies, and clinical practices, and all of the research that we carry out. Um, please enjoy this presentation today. You're learning from an advocate who has learned to apply rigorous research to her interest, both personally and professionally. Dr. Braveman, thank you.
Hello, everyone. Um, it is a, a real pleasure to be here today, and I want to thank the School of Public Health for the invitation to come here, and I particularly want to thank um, Dr. Lori Andrus, um, uh, who I know was instrumental in making the arrangements and whose work I have admired for some time um, uh, because of her very strong commitment to making sure that the kind of issues that we're going to be discussing today, that these issues are raised in public forums. So I'm going to be talking with you about the social determinants of health. And I, I want to begin by asking you a question, um, a, a rhetorical question. How can it possibly be that we spend more in the US on medical care than any other nation on the face of the earth. And yet, we consistently rank, this is for the last few decades, we rank at or near the bottom among other affluent, among affluent nations on key indicators of health. This shows you where we rank on life expectancy. We've known this for some time. Similar picture if I showed you infant mortality. Um, I was part of a study uh, of an Institute of Medicine study uh, that uh, came out about a year ago uh, in which we were asked to, uh, we were charged with answering the question of whether this disadvantage that had been seen in the U.S. Um, for some time on life expectancy and infant mortality, whether that extended across many health indicators um, and, uh, and across different stages of the life course. And the experience was really, it was shocking, actually. Um, I, I think I would not have been surprised. I mean, we know that to see this, we have to see it in, in particular indicators. But we looked at um, uh, over 100 different health indicators and across all age groups. And there were, with rare exceptions, there were really only a few exceptions where this wasn't the picture, where we weren't either you know, at the bottom or, or near the bottom. So how can that be when we spend so much on medical care? So I'd like to give you some, uh, some clues, I'd say, to what may be an answer. How many people here have seen this slide before? Um, it's kind of famous. This is the, the work of, of a Scottish physician named Thomas McCune, um, who published, uh, was publishing in the 1970s, and so his data go only through the, the, the early 60s. Um, but here he's tracing out um, infant mortality in England and Wales, starting in the mid-19th century. And what you see is this kind of wavy baseline for the last half of the 19th century, and then a precipitous drop at the beginning of the 20th century. And that drop, very, very steep, even before when penicillin became available. I mean, we didn't have antibiotics until the late, the late 1930s, the sulfonamides and sulfa drugs. Uh, and then penicillin wasn't around until 1941, and subsequently. Um, the, uh, you know, the advent of, of neonatal intensive care units was not until the early 1960s. Uh, and his point was that this big decline in mortality that is often credited to modern medical care, the big decline in mortality during the 20th century, it had already taken place before the modern modalities of medical therapy were really around. It's just another one of his charts, this one on measles, on measles mortality among children under 15, again, England, England and Wales. And you see that same picture, the, the wavy baseline in um, the latter half of the 19th century, the precipitous drop um, right around the turn of the, um, the 20th century. And all of that going on even before immunization began. 
Um, and th does it, anybody here know why, why someone would die of measles? Basically, it's, kids don't die of the measles unless they're malnourished. And as McCune put together the picture to try to explain this, and he traced out for several causes of death, traced out sort of uh, similar patterns, the conclusion that he reached was that the, the huge advances in life expectancy that have been achieved, that were achieved in the 20th century, were really a result of better nutrition, improved other improved living conditions, sanitation, clean water, sewers. Um, uh, he didn't talk a whole lot about public health efforts. There are a, a number of people who've challenged him on that and feel that he didn't adequately credit public health efforts. Um, uh, you know, the, the public health nursing, um, uh, efforts to educate people about sanitation. Uh, laws that were put in place um, that made better working conditions, somewhat better um, living conditions. So these, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a series of slides right now that um, uh, are, uh, almost all of them are of national data, almost all from the, from the National Center on Health Statistics that, that my group analyzed. Um, as part of our work to support the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Commission to build a healthier America, which was essentially a commission on the social determinants of health. Um, and here, um, what we did was to look at differences in uh, life expectancy at age 25. So this is not life expectancy at birth. It's the number of years of life you have left at, you know, at, at age 25, separately for men, separately for women, and um, broken down according to income group, and income expressed as a percentage of the federal poverty level. And in all the slides that I'm going to show you, going from left to right, you'll have the lowest income or uh, education group, and then on the, the right-hand set of, set of bars, it'll be the highest income or education group. Um, and I'm just going to be showing you, for each slide I show you now, I, I'll, I'll just show it to you for education or just for income, but I will tell you that the patterns that we found were essentially, es essentially the same, whether we looked at income or education. So here you see this dramatic, dramatic stepwise gradient of, uh, of uh, life expectancy at age 25 increasing as income increases. Uh, and it, you see a very, very big difference between the poor, those in the left hand, the farthest left bar, and those in our highest income group, which are those with incomes at or over uh, four times the federal poverty level. But you see differences of six, seven years for both men and women between the poor and the those in, in the highest income group. But what you also see, you don't see a cutoff. You don't just see here are the poor with a lower life expectancy and then there's everybody else. You see as income increases, so does the life expectancy. And it's not so easy to explain why it is with people, why men and women in uh, households where uh, the income is from two to four times the federal poverty level, why they should have a lower life expectancy than those with incomes four times the federal poverty level. And I'll refer to this, this gradient pattern. Here's another one. This um, is uh, the percentage of children reported by their parents to be in poor or only fair health. It, it's a measure that's self self-reported um, by, the, by the parents with all the limitations that self-reported data have, but it is used a lot, including in the, all of the, um, the surveys, uh, the uh, National Center for Health Statistics surveys, and is thought to be, um, to be a valid general indicator of, of health, not to make fine 
fine distinctions. But here you see, here we have more income groups, but again, going from the poor on the left to the, uh, those with incomes uh, four times the federal poverty level or more on the, the far right. And you see that as the income goes up, the percentage of children reported to be in poor or fair health goes down. This one is very dramatic, the difference between the, the poor and the highest income group. Um, is, is especially dramatic here, but again, you see differences. Um, these are significant, uh, significant differences for each level of income that we showed. And here we were able to look at more income groups than we could when we were looking at life expectancy. So with life expectancy, the highest group was over four times the federal poverty level, and the next highest group was two to four times the federal poverty level. Here, we could separate them out in just in 100% increments of the federal poverty level. And I would ask you, why would someone, someone uh, why would a child in a family whose income was three to four times the federal poverty level be more likely to have poor or fair health than a child in a family uh, with incomes over four times the federal poverty level. And this is just a, another, um, this is poor or fair self-reported health among adults. You know, again, all the, um, the limitations of self-reported measures, um, but, but felt to be felt to be worth, uh, worth looking at. And um, here, uh, here again, we see the stepwise gradient pattern, including the significant difference between the next to the highest group and the very highest group. Um, now, why am I going on and on and on about this gradient pattern? Um, and uh, the, the Reason there, there are two reasons. One is that I think you know when we see a difference in health between the poor and everybody else, it's a it, it, that's not so hard to understand. And you say the poor, where their uh, nutrition nutritional status isn't going to be as good. Maybe they're, they're in substandard housing, uh, and the kids are exposed to dust mites and mold and. Um, and people are living in crime-infested neighborhoods and some sort of obvious things. And uh, for the, for, so for the poor, I think it's not so hard for people to imagine why their health might be worse than, uh, than everybody else. But explaining why you'd see these incremental differences at each stage, that's an, another thing. And I think it, it challenges us to think about more that goes into the, the social factors that that influence health. Um, but the other reason that I'm making a big deal out of the gradient pattern is this, that you know, this, a relationship between poverty and health has been observed for centuries. Um, and uh, there are studies, you know, starting in the, in the 19, from the 19th century on, there is evidence of the relationship um, between poverty and health. And there's been an, an accumulation of evidence, particularly in the last, I'd say, 25 years, about the relationship between um, health and wealth and about education and, uh, and, education and, and, and health. Um, but there are some people, they're mainly these very hardcore economists, there are some people who say, no, the relationship, that this, these, are just, these are just associations, and associations don't prove causation. And, and that, that I agree uh, with, that associations don't prove causation. Um, uh, but there is a huge literature, I think, that is out there now um, that is looking at, that has looked at the relationships between factors like income and health and, fa and uh, education and health and shown the relationships, not just in crude cross-sectional studies like the ones that I've been showing you, but in longitudinal studies 
um, that would that would answer the question. Well, is it did the did the poverty cause the or the lower income cause the poor health, or did the poor health cause the lower income? And we know, we know it goes in both directions, absolutely. But I, and I think there have been enough longitudinal studies and studies with um, with rigorous enough designs right now to say. If, yes, it goes in both directions, but overwhelmingly the most important direction is from wealth to health, from education to health. Um, and other things, when you uh, think about what, whatever you were taught about causal inference in your, in your epidemiology courses, what, what are the criteria for thinking that an association actually you know, represents causality? So one is that it's, it's a strong association. It's not just, it, it's not just something kind of weak and tenuous. Um, there's a consistency and a reproducibility about it. Um, and, um, and I can tell you that this meets that criterion. And, and I should also comment that in terms of looking at different indicators here, we looked at uh, scores of indicators you know, at different stages of the life course. And what we found was that for more than half of the indicators among non-Latino whites, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, this gradient pattern dominated. Um, among non-Latino whites and among, uh, and among African Americans, this gradient pattern predominated. Among um, uh, among Latinos, we didn't see it as often. We saw it about that gradient pattern about, say, 40% of the time, not the, you know, the, the whole time. Um, but so I think in, in terms of meeting the criterion for causal inference about the, uh, about being, um, being pervasive um, and being, being reproducible, um, you have it there. So what's a, another criterion? Okay, the, the chronologic sequence has to make sense, right? If you say this is the cause of this, this has to be, you have to have evidence that this came before this. And we have that from, from longitudinal studies. What's another criterion? Biolo it has to be biologically plausible. And I'm, I'm going to be talking about that for a, for a bit in, in just another minute or two. There is um, a, there is a huge body of knowledge that has accumulated um, telling us that the connections between income and health, and not just poverty and health, but income, uh, you know, across the, um, the income levels, between income and health or, uh, or wealth and health, between education and health, and between a number of other social determinants and health. Um, that th there is a body of literature speaking to the biological plausibility of those um, conditions. And I'm not saying that, oh, we, now we know everything there is to know um, and everybody agrees about, uh, about everything. Um, that's not what I'm saying. Um, but I am saying that there are bodies of literature from very credible sources by respected scientists um, who uh, who uh, present have presented credible evidence on the biological plausibility. So the the last criterion for making a causal making a causal inference that I'm going to mention now is a dose response relationship, which of course doesn't prove that you have a causal relationship, but it increases the plausibility of the causal connection. And what does that look like to you? A dose response relationship. Okay. Now I'm going to show you a couple of, of slides. I'm still on the gradient <laughs> issue, but a, a, a different point. Um, that in those other slides, it was just all the racial ethnic groups um, together. And we found, my colleagues and I found, um, in presenting uh, the presenting some of those findings that some people would say oh that's just that's about race uh, and uh, and so we looked at things this way to answer that question and 
here um, we broke down the sample into three largest racial or, or ethnic groups. And here we were looking, uh, here's its income again and the five income groups. And what you can see is that that stepwise incremental gradient of health improving, in this case, again, it's adults self-reported poor or fair health. The gradients are at least as striking within each racial or ethnic group as they are within the um, as they are for the population as a, as a whole. And then this, um, just finally one, this shows you one by education. But I've told you that for all the slides I've been showing you, the basic shape and the conclusions you would have drawn was really, um, really very similar, whether we used education or income. Here we had enough numbers to break the population down into more groups than we've ever had before, frankly, and that most people have. And we're actually even able to show um, uh, American Indians and Alaskan Natives uh, on this, as well as um, Asians and Pacific Islanders. And it's the same, it's the same story there, that as the um, resources improve, this, in this case the resource is education, then the um, percentage of adults with uh, poor or only fair health um, diminishes. So I want to make it clear that I'm not saying, um, I'm not saying then that race doesn't matter, that it's just all about income and education, i.e. socioeconomic status, you know, not, not at all. Um, and just to illustrate this, we sort of turned the analysis on its head and said, okay, now let's look within the income groups and see then what the racial or ethnic differences are within the income groups. And you see, you do see some racial and ethnic differences here, but they're much less dramatic, in fact. The differences by race or ethnic group within income group are far less dramatic than the differences um, by income were overall or, or, by, or within each racial or ethnic group. And I'll talk a little later about what this could, what could this be? What are these residual differences by race um, that, are, that are here? So now to, to talk about the, the plausibility of the connection between social factors like income and education on the one hand and health on the, the other, the plausibility, including the biological um, plausibility. You know, how could income influence health? And there's some pretty obvious ways. Um, one would be by determining medical care that people can get. A healthy diet costs more than, a, an, than an unhealthy diet. You have more physical activity options. If you have more money, you can belong to a gym. You can buy or rent a home in a neighborhood where it's safe to exercise, um, et cetera. You can buy healthier housing. So you know, can you um, buy or rent a home that's going to be free of lead, dust mites, mold, um, uh, you know, that will give your kid, uh, increase your, your, your kid's chance of having asthma. Neighborhood conditions, what, what kind of neighborhood can you afford to, to live in? Um, so those are all obvious, and, and especially if you think of the distinction just between the poor and everybody else. Um, it gets a little harder, though, to explain those differences between, say, the two highest income groups or the two highest education groups on those, on those obvious um, obvious points. But I think a, a, um, a, uh, a factor that people don't often think about is how income, our income can influence our health insofar as it, um, as it gives us the ability to purchase services. And how those services, just even apart from the material effect of those services, the ability to purchase services can um, uh, can relieve stress. 
um, or, and can avoid stress. So uh, to give an example, two people dealing with a, a child care catastrophe, their child care has, has fallen through. One person has a good income, the other really, really marginal. Well, the impact of that, those child care arrangements falling through um, could be very, very different for them. Uh, for one person, that could be the thing that um, tips them over into homelessness if they lose their job because they can't get, they can't afford the alter the childcare alternatives that they can find are too expensive for them, too far away. They don't have a car, etc. So they're late to work or they miss days of of work and they're out of a job and you know just that it's a very different stress level that you're coping with. For the other person, of course, having your childcare arrangements fall through is, is stressful. It is for, for anybody, but it's a different, it, it's on a whole different level um, when, the, the, when you have the capability, when you have a lot more options uh, and you're, you're not afraid that this is going to be the end in terms of for your, your job um, and uh, in, you know, losing the home, you know, home and not being able to put um, food on the, on the table. And we know that stress can affect family stability, that where there are situations of more stress, families are more likely to, there's more likely to be conflict um, and family disruption, and that in turn is a source of stress. Um, so I think we can trace a lot of pathways from income to health. Um, but they've just been thinking about kind of at one, one time in, in life. Now let, let's think of it sort of cross-generationally. And if you, you think about it, the income of a parent can shape a child's education in virtue of how the quality of schools vary by neighborhood. So can you afford to buy a home, buy or, buy or rent a home in a neighborhood where there are good schools? Or if there aren't great schools in that neighborhood, can you afford to send your kid to, to private schools? Um, and the quality of the schools is a big determinant of the ultimate educational attainment. Um, so there's a way in which the, the, the effects um, from the, uh, you know, from one generation are passed on to the other. And then your education is the most likely factor. That's what shapes our occupational choices. Um, uh, for anybody, uh, I don't know if there's anybody here who comes from, um, from long-term, uh, long-term um, tremendous wealth. So families from, you know, families that have had family wealth handed down through, through generations, this isn't so true of them. But for the rest of us, let's say for the 99.9% um, percent of us, percentage of us, the, it's, it's our occupation that's going to drive the income that we're going to earn, uh, the income and then the wealth that we can accumulate. And so with that income then, you just go then back to the left side of this, this slide and about, about all of these factors. And the occupation also shapes, of course, the working conditions, healthy versus unhealthy working conditions. Um, the question about who has more stress, um, uh, you know, there's a line of thinking that would say that the, the ones with more stress, those are the high level executives, you know, high powered, high powered people, you know, and the, the people in the menial jobs, that's, um, you know, they have a lot less stress because they don't take it home with them um, and, you know, they're not worried about, they don't have to prepare a PowerPoint presentation for the next day. Uh, and, um, but the data, uh, the data don't support that. The data support a relationship between income and stress um, in which those with the most stress are those with the least income. And I think it supports the interpretation that I was just giving you about how income can, um, can uh, 
give you the resources to either avoid stress, to manage stress, um, to experience less stress. And this is just, th these are findings from, from California, from a, a survey, an annual survey of maternal and infant health that I work on with the um, California Health Department. And um, just as an, an illustration here, I mean, this was among, th these are postpartum women uh, that are surveyed for, for this. Here again, we've arrayed the by income from left to right, the poor on the left and the highest income group on the right. And we have <clears throat> uh, here just showing you the percentage of women in each of those income groups who um, reported um, that they experienced separation or divorce during pregnancy. And you see that by now familiar stepwise gradient uh, relationship. Uh, I'm just showing you this one, this slide on the showing separation or divorce, but we looked at 11 different major stressors, including some of the, the standard stressful life events, and the shape was basically like this um, for everyone. So just thinking a little bit more about how income could affect health and the, the plausibility of that. So, we know that uh, you know your income often determines uh, I mean, your income determines the kind of neighborhood that you can live in, and often how healthy that how healthy or unhealthy that neighborhood environment is. And some of the aspects of neighborhoods that might influence health are obvious, like the first ones on this list: the safe places to exercise and the access to healthy food. Um, the plethora of ads for harm, harmful substances, that's been well supported that those target low income uh, neighborhoods. Um, but other factors that I've listed here, people don't think about quite uh, as much, and yet there is a literature. And, and I just want to, I want to, um, th this is uh, a general point that I'm, I'm going to be talk, continuing to talk about a number of links between different factors. Um, and links between those factors and health. And um, in, in each case, I'm not claiming that there is 100% consensus in the field about that. For some things, there is. Um, but the criterion um, that I've used in putting this together and in what I, and what I, what I write about is that there is a critical mass of literature from respected sources that would, would support um, this. So uh, a very powerful way in which a neighborhood can influence health um, is thought to be through the social networks and the social support that are there in the neighborhood. The norms and the role models, the peer pressure, really important for kids. Are you living in a neighborhood where what your kid is seeing um, is that the, the cool kids are in gangs and they're hanging out in street corners and they've, they're out of school and they're doing drugs? Um, or are the cool kids ones that are going to college and they're participating in sports? Uh, and that can have a very, very powerful effect on young people. Um, but another way in which a neighborhood can affect health, but it's the health of the next generation, I, I just talked about that about two slides ago, is um, because the quality of schools, because of the way that public education is financed in this country, um, where it is heavily dependent on uh, local property taxes, it guarantees that the wealthy areas are going to have more more money for schools, public schools, than the than the poor areas, um, and so the parents' income then determining the the neighborhood, which drives the quality of the schools, which drives the educational attainment of the offspring, and then their income and et cetera, with a, more of a, of a vicious cycle. Um, and I just I, I, I want to make a, a a point here. That's why I put it in yellow, that, um, that racial segregation systematically tracks blacks and Latinos into poorer neighborhoods even than, than whites even of the same income. And that has been well documented. And so when characteristics of the neighborhood are not me measured in a study, they're leaving out the possible role of 
uh, you know, of a number of characteristics of the neighborhood that could have uh, powerful effects, but including the uh, in, including levels of crime, violence, um, and the, the the quality of schools, but but all of these factors. So we've been talking about the link between stress and health, and this is one of the areas relevant to the social determinants of health. Um, in which I think we've had some of the biggest leaps, um, the biggest um, scientific leaps in the last 15 to 20 years, and a lot of them have been in neuroscience. And um, that advances um, in neuroscience have shown us how social factors like education and like um, income can affect health, how they get into the, actually into the body. Um, we know, I think it's, at this point, it's been well documented, the involvement of the, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, um, but also the sympathetic nervous system, um, the involvement of immune, uh, immune phenomena, inflammatory, um, inflammatory mechanisms, that all of these have been shown to respond to stress. Um, and th that there's a, a, a it's sort of a, a range of areas. Many people think what well, they think of stress, and if they think about the physiology of stress, they think about about cortisol. Um, but it's a lot more than that, um, as we've learned now, including role of um, sympathetic nervous system and uh, the uh, well, the inflammatory um, the cytokines and um, and. Telomerase, so the telomeres, the caps on the ends of chromosomes um, and that shorten over the lifespan, and that shortening of um, telomeres um, is a very good marker of biologic aging, and that has been shown to be um, highly correlated with um, with stress. Um, a couple of studies, just even in the last the last couple of years, but what we've learned is not just We've learned about these mechanisms, and we've also learned that chronic stress is um, probably the you know the, the culprit here you know in in terms of how stress can um, damage health. That it's not so much acute stressors as it is chronic stressors, which it, it's a little counterintuitive. I think we think of these dramatic events that have somebody you know traumatized forever, and 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 of course that happens, but. Um, it, what we've learned is that exposure to chronic stress, and perhaps particularly in early childhood, um, can cause a dysregulation of the HPA axis. It can cause a dysregulation of immune systems that then, and this dysregulation persists um, over life, even when the person who's, who has experienced that because of adversity, even if they go on um, and experience less adversity later in life, but their, their, their systems are dysregulated and there's a toll being taken. Um, and, and typically, I think that you know, the, the link with, with health you know, from chronic stress is through effects on chronic, the likelihood of developing chronic disease. Um, and the biggest literature is on heart, heart disease, um, but also on, on diabetes. So this, just tracing out the, the uh, example of where, how the HPA axis would be involved, but it's not just the HPA axis. Okay, so now I wanna, I wanna talk for a few minutes about how education um, could influence health. And this is one pathway that I think is probably familiar to everybody in this room. Um, the, the, the way that education can influence um, health behaviors, uh, b you know, because people with different levels of education have different levels of health literacy. They can understand, they can appreciate um, the guidance, they can follow, um, uh, follow the regimens, um, they can navigate systems, um, so through more knowledge and also better problem solving skills and better coping skills, well documented how those go along with more um, 
education. So those lead to better health behaviors, and then the health behaviors lead to better health. Um, so that's one pathway. But a literature has accumulated, I think, that tells us that it's a lot more than just that. And that may, in fact, not even be the major um, pathway through which education influences health. But this pathway, and I've mentioned it in passing a few minutes ago, but you know, trace it out here. So our educational attainment determines the kind of work that we can get, and that work determines the income level that we're going to get, and then the income determines these, I just put a few of the factors um, here in this box because I couldn't, effect, uh, I couldn't fit them all um, in, but this is what I was talking about in relation to income. Affects the work, also affects work-related resources like having sick leave um, uh, and, and, and health insurance, so, so, uh, certainly. But work also, one aspect of work is the working conditions. Um, and I've written down here control demand imbalance. And I, I wouldn't expect that to be very familiar to many people unless you study um, these issues. But there are some studies that have indicated that if you're in a job in which there are very high external demands on you um, uh, and you have very little control over how you work um, or uh, control over some negotiation, the ability to negotiate about those, those demands, that seems to be a very toxic mix and it seems to be associated with a much higher risk of chronic disease. Um, and um, uh, uh, the, you know, the working conditions, the, the, the issue of stress is, um, you know, it, is there. Uh, the, the idea that, again, it's related to this control demand imbalance idea, the stress that comes from not having control um, even apart from the issue of what the demands are on you, that that seems to be very important. Okay, and all of those can lead to health. And now, yet another pathway that there's a literature on. Um, uh, so how educational attainment could lead to health through a number of psychosocial pathways. Now that issue of control, demand, imbalance, and stress um, at, at work, those are psychosocial issues, but, um, uh, but they went through the pathway that had to do with work and, um, uh, work and, and income, so I, I left them there. So here are these other psychosocial pathways here. Um, one of them through social standing. And uh, what is social standing? Th that could be externally, objectively measured, but it could also be where you see yourself in a hierarchy of social status um, in your society in relation to, to others. And there are really, there are quite a number of studies that have tied one's perception of one's relative social status to health, um, even, apart, even after controlling for uh, one's, quote, objective social status that might be measured by income or you know, occupational, occupational rank um, or, or education. Um, social networks, the people, th the, the people that you go to college with, the people that you go to medical school with, to nursing school, with um, uh, you know, those are those are often people who are in your networks for for life. But even throughout, even after completing your education, it's not just that the your educational attainment will give you access to different social networks. Then, but then the way it sets you on a path to be functioning in certain social networks, and your social networks could be a, a real resource for you. Right, it's through your social networks you could find out about job possibilities, um, uh, or your social networks could be uh, 
a source dragging you down. If all the people in your social network are desperate uh, and they're, they're constantly asking you um, to help, help them, um, that's a source of stress for you from your, your social network. Social networks, obvious, um, uh, important in affecting health behaviors because of, of the norms within a, within a social network, the very powerful effects of, of having different norms. And then here, to I've put sort of this general category of control beliefs that I think it's tied to that control demand and balance at work idea, but it's broader than that. And it's the idea of powerlessness uh, and this has certainly been looked at, the locus of control. Do you see it as inside you or, or something you can't control um, at, at all? Um, fatalism, uh, mastery, self-efficacy, there, there are lots of terms for it, but these, these are all beliefs about control. And those have been very tightly and consistently tied to um, the way people cope um, and the way that they respond to stressors. So, and so that the, all of these then could influence health and or through, you know, possibly through health behaviors, but not necessarily through health behaviors, could also be through stress pathways. Okay, and now what I've done here is just, I've put those, the last three slides that I showed you, I've put them on one slide, even though I know it's, it's hard to read the smaller, um, the smaller print, but the reason I want to put them on one slide is that what I want to acknowledge is how complicated it is to study the social determinants of health. Um, because I think there's good evidence to believe that all of those pathways are important. I think there's also good reason to believe that there are a ton of interactions happening. <laughs> interactions among factors that are on this slide and interactions with factors that aren't on this slide. Um, and these are playing out often, these are not playing out over a year or two, they're playing out over decades. Um, and a lot of the, um, and I think that this is one of the biggest challenges that we face in this field right now is that um, particularly the, the effect of early life conditions on health that's most likely in, in terms of actual health status effects it's not going to manifest until middle age um, or, or later. So you have these long and complex pathways with the possibility of interactions at every stage of the way um, and I'd like to know if anybody here could design a randomized clinical trial of the effect of education on health. Can't be done, right? So does that mean we can't study this? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, I think we have a lot of techniques in the armamentarium um, for, uh, for getting at this. Some is using uh, the connecting the dots and looking at intermediate outcomes and stringing, um, uh, stringing things together in that way, the, um, the, the inferences. Uh, there are, there are a, a lot of techniques that we use um, uh, to have quasi-experimental designs um, and um, a, large, a large armamentarium. I just, I want to define a term that I'm then going to use after this. Um, how many of you have heard, I mean, in the context of the kinds of things that I'm t talking about, have heard people talking about upstream factors? Some. I hear it a lot, but I, I also hear it not used really properly. And what, to somebody in this business um, of studying social the effects of social factors on health, upstream means that you're getting as close to the source of an effect as possible. And I, I, I like this, um, this illustration that here there's the, the factory, and the notion here is it's dumping pollutants into the air and into the stream, and then downstream somebody is drinking the water and experiencing the health effects. And traditionally, in, I mean, in medicine, we see 
we're seeing the health effects, um, uh, and uh, and uh, and we're and and most of our studies are designed to get at the the factors very proximal to where those bad health effects occurred. Um, but the problem with that is that we may miss. We're going to get stuck over on on this side here, and we're not going to realize the importance of the the more fundamental cause, the the root cause that sets in motion um, all of these pathways. Hmm. Okay. So I've mentioned how um, in the importance of early childhood uh, socioeconomic conditions, and um, we um, we now know that some of those the, the effects of exposure to adverse socioeconomic conditions in childhood may not be erased by later conditions, even if they um, improve and uh, lead to a risk of of, of chronic disease. Um, One of the most fascinating areas um, right now is the area of epigenetics. And I love this quote from somebody who's an emeritus professor at University of California, Davis, which he said, genetics loads the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. And I, I really like that way of, of thinking at it, that we've learned that the factors that someone are, is exposed to in their social or their physical environments those can lead to changes, and I think the best way to think about it is they, they affect um, a, a switch. They can introduce a, a switch, and that switch can, if that switch is on, that for, for a particular gene, then that gene's going to get expressed. And if the switch is off, that gene is not going to get expressed. So it's something that's not part of the DNA. And, and it's not we're not talking about changing the DNA, but we're talking about this other level of the, the, the switches that govern gene expression or, or suppression. And that what we've learned is that those, the experiences that um, result in these switches um, uh, can actually be inherited. They're, they're, not, they're not in the DNA, but they can be inherited and passed on from generation to generation. I, I think it just turns the whole notion of nature versus nurture, it just turns it totally on its, um, on its head. Um, and we know that policies can alter the, the triggers, the triggers in the environment, in the social environment, in the physical.